delightful it were on Ben Adair to rest before going over the white white sea. The dash of the wave as it launches its crash on the wind beaten shore is delight to me. Delightful it were on Ben Adair to rest when one has come over the white sea foam, his coracle cleaving her way to the west through the sport of the wave as she beats for home. How swiftly we travel, there is a grey eye, looks back upon Aaron, but it no more shall see while the stars shall endure in the sky. Her women, her men, are her stainless shore. Melodious her clerics, melodious her birds, her children are gentle, her seniors wise. Her men are lustrous, truthful in words, her women have virtues far love to prize. From the plank of the oak, where in sorrow I lie, I am straining my sight through the water and wind, and large is the tear. From my soft grey eye, looking back on the land that it leaves behind. Column Kill is reported to have founded over 300 churches across Ireland and Britain. 90 of these ruins remain today. Churches he established include Kells, Glen Column Kill, and where I am here today in Swords. My name is Pamela Finn, and you're welcome to this series about the life and legacy of Column Kill and his relationship with the Swords area. We have a life, a, a text which purports to be a life of Colum Kill, which was written in Derry in, in about 1150 or 1160 thereabouts. And it sends Colum Kill on a kind of a journey around Ireland, founding churches. That's the structure of this text. And he comes to Swords and he founds a church in Swords and he leaves um, a man called Finon Lower and he gives him a gospel book to, you know, to, as a relic, if you like. And that's a kind of a standard story about saints founding churches. It can be found all over Western Europe. But that's the original legend of the foundation of swords. Now, the history is something different because we think swords might originally have been founded as a very ancient church in the 6th century, but dedicated to St. Bridget and that it was a St. Bridget church for many things. But in the 10th century, there begin to be changes in the references to swords. And we think what happened is that this ancient church of swords, possibly dedicated to St. Bridget, was rededicated to St. Columba or St. Columcilla. And the person who would have organised that was the Norse king of Dublin, a man called Olaf Cora. And Olaf Curran eventually dies in the year 980, and he, in fact he goes to Iona, and he's buried in Iona, the columns, St. Columbkill's grave. So he had a devotion, a personal devotion to St. Columbkill. And the Vikings were originally p pagan when they came, you know, first of all, but they eventually convert to Christianity, but they got their Christianity up in the Western Isles of Scotland, where, you know, near to Iona, where Columbkill's monastery, where if like the influence of Christianity in that whole area was Columban and Columkilla. So we think what happened was that the Vikings then re-import to Ireland, particularly to Dublin, the Viking city of Dublin, Columban Christianity, or Christianity if you like, in honour of Columkilla, and that they begin, begin then to um, rededicate the churches in Dublin itself and in their hinterland, uh, in, in its hinterland to St. Columkilla. And of course, Swords was a very important church. It was a bounder, it was on the border of the Norse Kingdom of Dublin. 
and um, we think that it, that un, although the legends say that Colum Kill himself founded Swords, we think that Colum, uh, that Swords was really refounded as a Colum Kill church by this ki Norse king of Dublin, Olaf Cur uh, Olaf Curran, in uh, towards the end of the um, 10th century. Possibly the oldest relic associated with St. Colum Kill is a manuscript now kept at the Royal Irish Academy in Dawson Street in Dublin um, called the Cahoc. And the Cahoc is a copy of the Psalms, or partly, it's not all there now, but mainly um, it is a copy of the Psalms, most of which survives. But it has this name Cahoc, which means something like battle book or battle thing. And um, the, in the, it, it was, it, it, sometimes it's claimed that it was actually written by Column Kill, that you know, the handwriting is Column Kill's. And we know that the date of it is roughly right, so it could have been. We can't prove it was, but we can't prove it wasn't. It's roughly of the right date. But in the later Middle Ages, that book or manuscript was used as a relic of Column Killer. And the O'Donnells, who were the lords of Donegal, they took it into battle with them as a kind of a spiritual weapon. And they, they, a priest or monk or something, and it's very funny, it says he has to be as far as possible without mortal sin. And he carries it on his chest, this book. It, it has a chain and um, it hangs around his neck and he carries it on his chest and he proceeds or processes around the soldiers of the O'Donnells and that would bring them good luck and, um, in, in their battles. So it got this name, the Battle Book, because of that. Although in origin, it's a sixth century copy of the Psalms. Well, in the Christian church, we have a tradition of saints, and it goes back to the original time when the per Christians were persecuted by the Romans and their, their martyrs. But saints are not unique to Christianity. Many, many um, religions, world religions, have saints or their equivalent, you know, Islam and Hindu and Buddhism. They all have saints or at least something similar to saints. So they're not particularly unique to Christianity. Um, but uh, once Christianity became an official religion of the, of the Roman Empire, under the Emperor Constantine in about 3, 325 or thereabouts. Um, the, it, it became normal then, if you like, to honour important people. And to some extent the word saint, you know, we has, have a meaning for it now, kind of quite religious. But in origin it probably meant something closer to something like celebrity. They were celebrities of the churches of the early mid, Middle Ages. and. Although the Catholic Church, of course, continues to um, canonise saints. And I, I should say that canonisation doesn't make a saint. It's simply the recognition that somebody in their own lifetime was a saint, which is a subtle distinction. But um, the Catholic Church continues to canonise saints, but the Protestant churches, by and large, have stopped that. But they still, some of them, to some extent, honour the ancient saints. So, of course, the meaning of the word sword, sword's in English, but sword, column kill in Irish, and sword means uh, pure or clean, or very clean, you know, in that sense. And it seems originally to have referred to a well, a holy well. And, of course, there are holy wells all over Ireland, many of them dedicated to St. Colum Kill. It's not unusual that, that there would have been a holy well here. And that holy well, holy, like all other holy wells, 
um, was usually, it was really claimed that there would have been some healing power associated with, with the well. And it, it, it can't be coincidental that in the records, again in the legends, but the story is that a man called, that the, when Columkill founds swords, he leaves a, a cleric here called Finon Lore, and Lore is possibly the word leprosy, an old form of the word leprosy, does that Finon the, the leper or something like that. And you know, that Finon, you know, in a sense might have come here to get the healing waters of the well. But that's speculation and legend and we can't be certain of it. So what better place to finish than the monastery here that St. Columkill founded right here in Swords, where we continue to see his influence on the town. We want to wish him a happy 1500th birthday. Delightful it were on Ben Adair to rest before going over the white white sea. The dash of the way as it launches its crash on the wind-beaten shore is delight to me. Delightful it were on Ben Adair to rest when one has come over the white sea foam, his coracle cleaving her way to the west through the sport of the wave as she beats for home. How swiftly we travel, there is a grey eye, looks back upon Aaron, but it no more shall see, while the stars shall endure in the sky. Her women, her men, are her stainless shore. Melodious her clerics, melodious her birds, her children are gentle. Her seniors wise, her men are illustrious, truthful in words, her women have virtues far loved to prize. From the plank of the oak where in sorrow I lie, I am straining my sight through the water and wind, and large is the tear from my soft grey eye. Looking back on the land that 